Good morning, everyone. It's uh, time to get started. It's 5.30, and uh, since we're involved in career guidance, we're going to start you with the day as we start you with your life. Uh, I'm Rich Feller from Colorado State University, but more importantly, I'm here uh, representing the National Career Development Association. And we're going to try to use our minutes as best we can, so we're going to start right on time and ask you to take a look at the uh, binders you have to look at bios rather than spend a lot of time with that. But I think it's first important to reflect on some observations. We were here for a day and we're struck by how there's such great interest in expanding career guidance. And we talk about counseling as if it is career guidance and it's not. So we're going to talk to an exclusive um, or a really reputable panel who have looked at this question and try to give us some insights to what career guidance is all about. And you can see by the title, we'll try to look at a vision as well as take a look at how we take action. Uh, I'm struck, and my roots come from uh, junior high school teaching outside of Boston, and then I've been a counselor educator and doing a fair amount of training around the country, is that there's a lot of confusion about how does career guidance fit into counseling and comprehensive programs, and there's a paper for you that we've tried to spell out some of those issues. But I'd like to get right to the panel, allow them to make some comments. They'll introduce themselves and talk about themselves in the context with which why they're here and allow you to get some sense of how they see the whole movement of career guidance and what the, that vision looks like. We'll go through the panel one time and then come back and each one of them will respond to an individual question because of the kind of orientation and view they uh, bring. And then we'll finish and ask each of them to make some comments about maybe what's the most provocative thing they could say that would be useful as we move to a call to action. So again, thank you for your interest in career guidance. We need you. We're struck by how we live in silos, and we have been struck in the first day how people all talk about wanting more career <coughs> guidance. And in many cases, uh, we take it pretty hard. So thank you for your efforts to improve how we provide career guidance to students. And I'll ask us to get on the panel. Each person would introduce himself in terms of the context within which they work and how they fit into this discussion. So Rich, if I could turn it over to you to start, please. Sure, let me just launch right in. Yeah, uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, very, very good here to be here today. Um, I'm a professor, um, counselor educator at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And for the past 20 years, it has been my distinct privilege and honor to be part of the transforming school counseling, uh, paradigm changing work that we've been doing through the uh, American School Counseling Association, the National Career Development Association, and the American Counseling Association. Uh, most of my work has looked at the value added benefits when counselors do different kinds of things in schools, particularly around the ASCA national model kind of a developmental comprehensive approach. Now, um, I just wanted to start off real quick. Finish the statement for me. Uh, my high school counselor told me blank. Well, how would you finish that statement? It's all right, get it out. It's good, to, it's good for this all. My high school counselor told me I would never get into a four-year college. Okay. So this is something I take pretty personally in terms of, of, of what we're up to. Now, how many of your show of hands know about the kind of the paradigm changing work that's been going on in the school counseling field over the last 20 years that we call the ASCA National Model Comprehensive School Counseling Program? Okay, see, we need to partner up because we're on the same side in this. This is very, very important. And there's a lot of good work that would support what we're about to say. So I'm going to make a statement. I thought it was kind of provocative, but I think uh, my colleagues were, were, th were thinking, uh, yeah, that's, you're talking like a multiple regression equation trying to, uh, you know, be uh, careful about this. But I would say at least half of all 12th graders in the United States leave high school not having received the critical college and career development counseling services that both they and their families need. Uh, how many would you, would you agree with that? I mean, I, th I think that's a, I, I, I can give you, I'm not going to go into the data, but I can give you some data. Now, this is a big deal. And I think if you look at research both within the field of counseling and outside of the field of counseling, particularly the studies that have been very critical of counseling, we're all saying the same thing. We're really converging on a common message. And that is that the career and counseling, the college, the career development kind of work, the counseling that goes on, it's critical for how young people and their families plan for, prepare for, search for, apply to, transition into, perform while they're in whatever post-secondary training they go into, and then perform on the job. 
If you want a 15-pager um, that would give you that argument, um, there's a, a nice report, ACT, published just a couple years ago that shows that connection from middle school to high school to two-year colleges, four-year colleges, whatever, and then out into the workplace. It really kind of links that out and then talks about the cost value of that in terms of uh, gained wages. Now, one of the major reasons I think that there, there is this gap that I'm talking about is that students and families are not getting the best of what professional school counseling has to offer. So uh, what I've written about, and I'd be happy to share this with you, is the implementation gap that we have in the United States in terms of delivering ask a national model programs and this really I think you can see how this connects to the lack of career development and college counseling services that we're all uh, very much concerned about. Now my work is looked at when when you implement these kinds of programs wonderful things happen for kids and um, and, and you don't, please don't believe me on this, but I would encourage you to talk to several people. Donna Hoffman, Donna, you want to raise your hand? Nebraska Director of Guidance. Um, to, we did a, just did a statewide study in Nebraska, you know, finding very similar things. Bragg Stanley in Missouri, Judy Peterson in Salt Lake City. So it's very clear when you look at the research, when you do the career development part of what we're talking about, you see advantages for career planning and decision making, academic achievement, transitions from eighth to ninth grade, post-secondary success, discipline and suspension rates. I have some uh, data from Connecticut that we did. I can show you a pretty uh, clear argument. Um, graduation and attendance rates get better, course taking patterns, the whole idea about school connectedness, personalized relationships, and then workplace success. Now, the problem we're in, as I see it, is that when these things are not being implemented, um, just finishing a study in Massachusetts with 17 high schools, and it's very clear, it's, you know, the data is always consistent regardless of which state we're looking at, that when these things are not being implemented, counselors are not meeting very often with kids, and, and the students are saying that the meetings are only somewhat helpful. I mean, so, so a little bit of context, somewhat helpful. And I found some really despicable low expectations that um, colleagues will hold for kids. I mean, this is a very, very <laughs> I'm going to finish up. This is an old paradigm we need to fight against. It's individually oriented. It's passive and reactive. School counselors are not well trained. They don't see college and career uh, development as a critical component of their jobs. It's not developmental, uh, and they're trapped in non-guidance stacks. Now, the good news is this is low-hanging fruit. We know how to do this. This is no mystery uh, at this point. A uh, hundred years ago, Frank Parsons launched the vocational guidance movement in the United States right here in a little old Boston uh, at the Boston Vocations Bureau, which is over, in, uh, over by Faneuil Hall, it was over by Faneuil Hall. My sense is that if we link comprehensive guidance the way I think we're pushing on it with this career pathways idea, we could launch a 21st century a vocational guidance movement. The benefit uh, would be to all of us, and so what I'm hoping is that we can join up together and move in that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Good morning. My name is Lules Rivera, and I am a counselor educator, but prior to becoming a counselor educator, I actually worked in a college setting, a community college setting. Um, in a diverse neighborhood. And one of the reasons that contributed to my decision to move on to become a counselor educator was because many of the students, if not most of the students that I worked with, came to college with a sense of, yes, I need a certificate, I need a degree, I need some kind of preparation for the future. However, they didn't really understand what that was, what it meant to get a degree, what were the courses that they needed to take, what were the skills that they needed to have. So when I finished my studies in counseling psychology and had the opportunity to become a counselor educator, I decided, well, okay, this is an opportunity to really work with <coughs> individuals who are going to be providing the services in the schools to really help engage them in looking at how do we help students prepare for their futures in a way in which they are aware of and take responsibility for what they can do along the process. Unfortunately, my experience has been that when career guidance, career counseling is provided in the school system, it tends to be piecemeal. It tends to be we have a career day here, we may have some groups over here with some students, we may have an orientation or a presentation, but it is not done in a cohesive, comprehensive way. And usually when we focus on those kinds of programmatic efforts, they are very limited in the fact that they're looking at just one piece of the puzzle. And career development and career 
services should be provided in a developmental perspective because it is a developmental process. Just like students need to learn the example that was given um, earlier yesterday in one of the presentations, you, before you can learn calculus, you have to understand algebra. Before you can write an essay, you have to understand how to compose a sentence. Well, before we can engage students in understanding what possibilities and futures are out there, we need to engage them in the process of discovering who they are. What do they enjoy? What do they like? How is what they're doing today relevant to the future that they may want to have? And those types of discussions, those types of engagements happen very, very rarely. And that is the focus of career counseling within a school setting. And this is something that the professional school counselors definitely have a significant role to play. And they are the ones that can provide leadership and advocacy in this direction. But we need to really look at comprehensively how do services get provided to students long term. And so when we look at what is happening in the schools, we see that students really don't understand why they're taking the classes that they're taking. Who is explaining this to them? Who's having this conversation with them? Who's helping them identify what are the possibilities? We have a career day, but what does that mean to the student in terms of who they are and what they might want to do in the future? And those are the types of efforts that school counselors working in collaboration with everyone else in the school <coughs> building can really provide to students. And again, as my colleague said, you know, we have models out there that work. However, they're not being used. <coughs> And when we look at these models, we see that they really do have an impact. They really can make a difference. But because of a variety of different reasons, they're not being used. They're not being implemented. Counselors tend to be used as short stop gap efforts to deal with emergencies, with crisis, which, yes, is part of the counseling responsibility. But we need to be much more proactive. We need to be much more inclusive in who becomes part of this process. And that's what I'd like to see happening. And in the discussions that I've been hearing over the last day, there's a lot to be offered. There's a lot of good things out there. But the problem that I see is how do we do this together in a comprehensive way that is equitable for all students? And how do we work together to find systems that bring our different perspectives that because even though we have different perspectives and different approaches, one of the things that I see is that we have the same outcome. How to better prepare young people for a future in which they can support themselves, be satisfied, be healthy, be responsible, and be able to take care of their children and their families, and basically contribute back to society. And I think that school counseling, particularly through focusing on career guidance, career counseling, School counselors can really contribute to that effort and that goal. But as was said previously, we really need to work together and really understand what we each, in our different professional capacities, have to offer. And how can we work together to make sure that priorities are set that really are in keeping with what the outcomes are that we want for individuals. And not outcomes in terms of test scores. I think those are important, absolutely but outcomes in terms of how does this person feel? How do this person see themselves? And what possibilities do they see for themselves in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Spencer Niles, and uh, Rich, my uh, school counselor, never told me anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which is worse. But uh, <laughs> we did have, I think, some conversations in the hallway or something. That was about it. But uh, to provide a, a bit of uh, context in terms of my connection here, I'm also a, a counselor educator currently at Penn State, previously at the University of Virginia. And for the uh, 26 years I've been a counselor educator, my uh, primary work has focused on training graduate students in the area of career intervention. I've also uh, uh, directed a, a career counseling clinic for adults in the community who are either unemployed or underemployed, and I've also worked with adolescents in a variety of, se of settings to help them make uh, effective career decisions. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here this morning, and I'm grateful to have had the chance to, uh, to learn from the many excellent presentations that uh, have occurred so far. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, the good news is that uh, we're a lot closer to some meaningful solutions than one might assume at, at first glance. But I do think it requires connecting the dots 
across the many areas of expertise that are represented in this symposium. We, we do, in, from my perspective, every viewpoint's a point from a view, and so from my, my uh, view, it seems like we are in, uh, operating in a bit of a, a siloed mentality, uh, all of us. So um, in the uh, brief comments uh, I'd like to, uh, to make this morning, there are three points I'd like to share with you. First is that there is, uh, as fo folks have alluded to already, there is substantial evidence within developmental psychology that can be used to inform career development interventions. We also know that career, careers unfold across the lifespan in a somewhat predictable pattern, especially during childhood and adolescence. And we also know that we can make learning relevant and we can create a sense of hope within students. The United States has really been a leader, maybe the leader, uh, in producing research related to career development theory and practice. And from that, we know that individual, individualized career counseling is the most effective strategy, but obviously it's also the most expensive. We know that group interventions are both effective and efficient. We know that effective career interventions provide the appropriate amount of three types of support depending upon the student's career development needs. That's appraisal support, informational support, and probably most importantly, uh, emotional support. We know that uh, career development literature contains developmental frameworks, of, as folks have already mentioned, that identify specific career development tasks across the lifespan. And these career development tasks, which are really simply reflections of societal expectations for career behavior, change the society, you change the, uh, the develop developmental tasks, that they tend to be predictable, that career development uh, curricula exist to help persons cope successfully with these tasks. And we know that uh, developmental frameworks are important because success at one developmental level, bless you, fosters success at uh, another uh, le career development level. And we know that positive career development can be guided and facilitated by providing individual, group, classroom, and experiential interventions. These developmental uh, progressions are really the, the precursors for uh, making career and educational plans. And the National Career Development Guidelines provide detailed descriptions of these developmental tasks. So although resources exist that could be used to foster readiness for career decision making, comprehensive and systematic development programs don't happen without the support of administrators, policy makers, teachers, parents, and school counselors. The unfortunate truth is that um, most times, Career development programs exist, as Lord has said, in piecemeal fashion, if they exist at all. And despite the lack of comprehensive uh, and career development support, we still expect all students to make career and educational plans at specific points in their educational careers, regardless of their readiness. And uh, this is, I agree, this is like ignoring math in elementary and middle school and when a, when a kid hits ninth or 10th grade, expecting them to be ready to take it on. Just doesn't make sense. I do think that there are important discussions happening here related to creating strong business and education partnerships. Employers really can provide the experience that helps students connect their school activity with their future work opportunities. But as we know, many, many students wonder how their future possibilities relate to their respective, their respective uh, opportunities. Without, uh, many, many students wonder, um, excuse me, without hope, many students lack hope relative to their future uh, opportunities. And without hope, planning for the future makes no sense. And, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm myself here. Um, and without, without hope, planning for the future makes no sense and current school activities lack personalized meaning. Intentional hope-based interventions provide the momentum that students need to even consider the process of systematic educational and career planning. Because with hope, students see reasons for engaged activity because they realize the connection between their current experiences and their future possibilities. And research data suggests that uh, there is a 
connection, a significant connection between hope, student engagement, and academic performance. Standards-based education focusing exclusively on, on math, <coughs> science, and language arts while necessary typically ignores the student development, career development connection. And when accountability standards ignore career development, it's not surprising that such activities become de-emphasized within such an educational model. So I think there's work uh, to be done, but there are resources that can be put to work to help students manage their careers more effectively. I think we just need to connect the dots. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm a Canadian. Uh, I'm the one they let in. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, first of all, I want to say hats off to Harvard for making this happen. This is so amazingly important. We've got to make it a milestone uh, event. Let me f go on to say that uh, I'm totally unqualified to be sitting at the front of the room here. I have a BA in Economics and Commerce from the Royal Military College in Canada. I went from that to jumping out of planes and mountain climbing. And, uh, and then when I decided I had to stop playing games and get serious, I joined the Canadian federal government from the military to your Department of Labor equivalent, which would be our Human Resources Skills Development in Canada, and ended up um, inventing a computer-based system for them called Choices. Uh, and I had researched all of the systems in the U.S. I, got, I had a great boss who I always said he, he, he he was the kind of guy who gave you enough rope to hang yourself, and as long as you didn't, he kept giving you rope. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I researched all the U.S. systems and made the promise, because I was really looking, at what could we adapt to Canada from the U.S.? It must be the leader. Um, it, it ultimately ended up going in a slightly different direction. There was a, sh a Super Bowl of computer systems in Florida in 1979 with all the U.S. systems at the time and this choices system that, uh, that I'd invented in Canada. After two days of looking at all of them, 93% of the 365 Floridians who were there from the Education Department voted uh, and, and chose choices. So uh, it turns out that that Canadian system has been going in Florida ever since then and is still going in every school in, in Florida. I'm very proud of that. I had no qualifications to create that system. Uh, and I've, uh, I've, gomer, I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've managed to go just by being in the right place at the right time uh, into programs that have, have gone statewide. I mean, that program went statewide in 13 states and is in virtually every other state. It, it went coast to coast across Canada for many years and has only recently been replaced by the system I now work with, career cruising uh, across Canada. 13 other countries. I've worked with educators for 40 years around the world. I've got a perspective that I think might be a little bit unique on, on guidance. I think it's totally broken, totally dysfunctional. It's not working. We have to completely rethink the whole thing. And with all of that si deafening silence, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I haven't seen the signs, um, let me just add that. It's not, we, it's not that we don't know. We do. We know lots of terrific programs, lots of terrific resources. We're just not strategic. We're not smart. We're not pulling together. We're not doing what needs to be done to, 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 to create the transformation. And Bob's going to follow me, and I think South Carolina is perhaps the best example in the US of a state that has got it together. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Bob Couch, and my experience uh, with the guidance counselor was basically take home this big sheet and have your parents to fill in the courses. So uh, looking at me this morning, I was thinking about coming from the double tree over here, uh, literally from poverty of where I had no running water and no inside toilet, uh, to sitting here at Harvard campus is a rather daunting experience. And... Uh, it does, however, tell me you can go from wherever you are to where you want to be. So um, I treasure that experience. I had a family that truly loved me and, and sought uh, to drive me forward. Uh, my dad was an eighth grade dropout uh, due to farming, went back and completed his degree, and he had 3,000 books in his library when he died. So, uh, so education has always been important. Uh, my experience includes both establishing uh, career centers at college level, 
Uh, I have uh, sort of a triple life, one in business and industry, where I served as Vice President of Human Resources for a major hospital regional system of 7,000 employees. I uh, have both uh, secondary and post-secondary experience as teacher as well as administrators. To me, uh, the topic that we have here is critical in the fact that we have to transfer the ownership of a pathway for the future to the student. And so much of what we plan to do with guidance is the guidance counselor owns it. Many times they own the decision. And so therefore, it is difficult and has been difficult to transfer that ownership over to the student where they see themselves in the driver's seat of decision making. And so we have two factors here. One, missing parents, uh, parents that maybe are with the child but are still missing. And to be able to have the influence of the parental decision making in regards to the career decision making is a critical uh, component as well. I believe the guidance counselors are strapped with too many administrative duties. Uh, there are too many things, and I think counselors tend to be caring people and pleasing people and helpful people. So therefore, when superintendents and principals need things done, they call the counselors to do it. So that's one of the challenges we face. I do think when you look at the situation in terms of how you roll this out, I do think and uh, that we did some things in South Carolina. Hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about that uh, here at the end. I think on career awareness, and that is the K through five system, is it has to be more diverse. Uh, it's more than going to an airport. It's more than having doctors to come in and talk to the children. I think it has to be broader, and it has to be more, certainly more diverse. Uh, secondly, is that in the middle school where you get really the, the career uh, exploration, it has to be more robust. It has to be something that is meaningful, that is challenging, and we've, we've done that in our state, uh, I think, uh, uh, to help drive some of the change there. And, in, and career uh, preparation and at, at the level of where really some of the decisions began to emerge for students is I think there has to be opportunity for students to be able to get more experiences in the real world, and I think these experiences, whatever they may be, have to be more relevant uh, to the student to get a real world view of, of what uh, they'll be facing. I do think that a lot of counseling, and I have a, a close to a master's in clinical psychology, and in fact uh, had planned to go that route at one time, and I understand uh, the, the other issues that counselors face, everything from suicidal tendencies and other kinds of things and issues that guidance counselors face. I do think the majority of the issues that our young people face is in career decision making. When they find passion about what they want to do, a lot of these other issues begin to fade away. Uh, young people without purpose will find a dysfunctional purpose. And until they find a concrete purpose for which they see and can have passion and inspiration about, many of them, as we've heard in, this, in the last uh, couple of days, there is a feeling of hopelessness. Uh, in spite of my poverty, I never lost hope. And I think that is part of the reason I'm here today is my parents had hope and they transferred that to me. All families do not have that. So many times that hope is brought to the school door steps, we have to create that opportunity for students in those environments. So I think that the, the emphasis of the future and the coordination of guidance systems is that career uh, development has to be the central focus of where students need to go and things they need to be able to do and just as we found in the center I built the last year, is that when you transfer learning to the responsibility of the student, they will learn at higher levels. I think that when you transfer ownership of the future of young people and they find their passion, I think their future will change. Thank you, Bob. I think that gives us a little bit of a baseline and maybe context. We're quite aware many of us in the audience are not career practitioners. We also now want to shift from setting that baseline to ask specific questions of each of the individuals based upon their experience. So I'll ask a question of each one of them. They'll each have three minutes to respond. And then again, we'll come back with one closing comment and make time for questions. So Rich, if you don't mind, would you please um, 
respond to this. <laughs> What's something that everyone in this audience could champion um, to create a better career guidance planning system <laughs> for outcomes? Um, I'd say quite simply, if we could walk away from here championing that, we fully implement a high quality comprehensive school counseling program in every school in the United States. That would be a major step forward. Now, there are five qualities that I'd like to talk about that when I, when I think about what that would look like. First of all, we have to deal with the problem of ratios. Uh, Ask a National Model has been arguing for 250 students per counselor. Okay, um, uh, clearly in many, many states th that's not the case. I, I would argue, um, uh, and I go into my own background, but without a personalized relationship, you're, we're not going anywhere. I mean, meaning making, I would, I would think Phil would also agree, it's within the relational learning context that these online programs can be very helpful. Okay, so that, that's the first thing, ratios. And I have some data from Connecticut, Missouri, uh, Utah, Nebraska to kind of back that up. I'd be happy to share with you. So the second thing would be 50% of counselors' time, so half, two and a half days every single week, should be spent on career development and college counseling activities that would incorporate this pathways idea. So be fully integrated within that and would be developmental in nature. So we all know, I mean, when does career development really start? Okay, I mean, isn't it not like gender role stereotypes? It's a kind of very, very early. You know, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics talk about stereotype threat. I'm not a math kind of person, kind of crystallizing around about what, fourth or fifth grade? Okay, is that not a career development issue? Mathematics self-efficacy and then how that blots out opportunities? It uh, certainly is. So but really focus, but ha at least half of a counselor's time. 30% of a counselor's time, that's 80%, would be on what we call responsive services, dealing with social emotional issues, individual crisis, referral, all of the group kind of counseling activities. So that's 80%. We need to minimize, and, and I think uh, my colleagues were talking about this, non-guidance counselors' use of their time on what we would call non-guidance tasks, low-level administrative tasks, clerical tasks discipline, testing. Um, I did a study uh, with the Chicago Public Schools and uh, we heard, I mean, we talked to uh, uh, counselors that one of their jobs was to drive the high stakes test over to the place where it was collected, okay, uh, and, and provide test security. I mean, I, I, we have to really get out of this and move in a very different direction. And the last thing, so ratios, half time on career, 30% on uh, responsive services, minimizing non-guidance tests, then we need to take a whole school approach. Okay, this is not, we're not talking about an individually oriented approach. We're talking about small group classroom interventions. Um, I, I'd like to, if we have time, I'd like to share with you, a, a pro, I think a promising practice is to fully integrate what we're talking about into standards-based instruction. And I, I've got some examples from some English language arts curriculum we're developing at the middle school level. And I'd like to share with you a couple of the multi kind of uh, paragraphs, so some of the student writing, and you see how they're grappling with these issues about meaning. It's almost like, a, uh, I, 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 if, how many of you read Heidegger? The Call of Conscience, Existential Crisis, Taking Ownership of Your Life. It's amazing, these seventh graders writing about these things. But th th taking charge of their life is a very, very important thing. The other thing is this is not a hard sell for students. Students like career development kinds of activities, and it always comes up on, on whatever need survey you do as one of the very type things that young people want help with, and we'll talk to you about. Um, so, um, uh, those. Uh, so thinking about, I don't know if we want to go into specific data, but I, we've got studies from the uh, state of Connecticut, and I can show you, you can't see this, but it's a nice little ascending ladder, is that as the ratios of counselors to students gets worse, discipline and suspension rates go up, okay? It's almost like a, a, an ascending ladder. You could walk right up it, okay? One of the problems is, is that as the percent, of, as the dollar spent for child goes down, Okay, what happens to the ratios? They get way worse. So it's like, you know, so exactly in the schools where you want more support, support's not being provided. Okay. Um, I also have data here from the state of Missouri. That I, so I broke down high poverty schools and looked at those schools that had the ratio of 250 to one. Uh, and what you see is those high poverty schools that have this 250 to one, just looking at the ratio data, uh, you, you find better graduation rates and also attendance patterns. 
Okay, so this is the kind of, I think, encouraging kind of good news that we would talk about, what we'd like to share with you. Um, in the sh Chicago, one of the things I did is that there's like 130 so public high schools or high schools that we looked at, uh, and I, I pulled out those schools where both the principal and the counselor were saying that the career development and career counseling was going on. And, I, and it was surprising, I mean, it was very encouraging to see, in, you know, that that particular group, they had a larger percentage of students applying to three or more colleges, the percentage accepted to college they planned to attend, and they had better dropout rates. Um, you know, th and this was from, so we connected that up to the uh, student exit survey that as students leave the, um, so, uh, the uh, Chicago Public School. So this is kind of hard to connect to uh, data. It's the same data that uh, potholes on the road to college. I don't know if you, if you read that report. Um, I have another um, little graph here from Chicago where as the percentage of students uh, on free and reduced lunch increase across high schools, what you find are the counselors are doing way more non-guidance tasks. So it's in those very schools that we would want to have counselors delivering these kinds of services that I'm not, I don't really believe that they are um, as to, to that extent. At least I, I would put that out there. So now we think about this as a whole school approach. This is a middle school curriculum uh, we've been working on where it, it's fully integrated into Common Core ELA standards. The counselor works as part of an interdisciplinary team. Uh, the special education teachers involved, the librarians involved, the, um, obviously the classroom uh, ELA teachers involved, and the counselors go into the classroom and deliver uh, integrated lessons. Okay. Now, um, here's, I've got two paragraphs I'd like to share with you that kind of, some, I think, captures for me what, what I'm trying to get at. Um, and this is the first one is a, um, this is an urban school. This is a young African American woman, seventh grade, or who actually scored on our Massachusetts uh, MCAS and the advanced, so that she scored at the very top. But four months before she took this test, uh, this is what she wrote. And this was part of a multi pair So we had, um, we delivered inquiry and research based instruction about how to write. So it was part of the common core standards. But what they were investigating was what do I want to be as I grow up? What, what do I want for myself? How am I going to get take, take charge of the middle school to get me going to where I want to go? Okay. So this is what she said. She goes, My life is a bright purple book with a white question mark that pops on the cover. Each page is silky smooth with a gold border around the edges. As I open my book and jump in, I begin to walk. As I am walking, I hear many stories of the struggles I will face and already have. In the sky, I see myself fighting those struggles, and in the end, I come out on top. This makes me optimistic uh, for what the future will hold. I stop to feel the soft, warm air as it touches my cheek. Then I take a deep breath in and smell nothing but my aspirations. Uh, as I walk deeper into my book, I taste success, something I long for. This is the best feeling in the world. Not too shabby, huh? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, optimism and aspirations were two of our vocabulary words. And so we also then linked up what the, you know, what the career development outcomes were associated with optimism and asp aspiration. So, but the best predictor of the gains from sixth grade to seventh grade on the MCAS was this making of a personal commitment to being successful and making informed career and college decisions. Okay, and this ties up with other work that we've done. So it's an issue of synergy, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Working as part of an interdisciplinary team, you, you really can bring this to scale and it can be sustained within a school setting. Okay, so, so, so we're really not talking about individual uh, approaches. Okay, that's the first one. So I call that first one, life is good. Okay, here's the second one, uh, life is upset. I'm standing in the middle of the road waiting for something. I gaze up at the white clouds and I notice its color change from a happy blue to a mean gray. The icy raindrops hit my skin like a TV smashing into a wall. The wind was moving the trees as if it wants to pull it by the roots. That's when it hit me, a whirlwind is coming. My life is just like that whirlwind. It goes round and round. The whirlwind was too fast because I had to manage a lot of things, especially when I lost my grandmother. Way before she left, my life was so great and fun, I never had whirlwind. After she left, my life went downhill. This is when the whirlwind had just begun. I was very optimistic that it would slow down. I was wrong. Okay. Now, talk about hearing the voices of students as they talk about. So when we talk, when I talk about career development, I'm talking about 
focusing on positive futures is some of the best ways to get at social and emotional development as well. So how many of you know about wraparound schools and dealing with the full, right, really? So do you know about wraparound schools and about, okay, so how would you go about, when I read this, as a psychologist, as a counselor, uh, who's, I've, done, I've worked in a number of different settings, it's like saying, okay, here's a young person I need to be providing some support to. Okay? And, and you can, so by talking about positive futures, you can get to every social emotional issue that you, wanna, that you want to talk about. So I have a lot of experience working with kids in incarceration, uh, adolescents um, coming in and out of uh, uh, jail programs, psychiatric hospitals. Um, I would argue that if you really wanna get some traction, think about the hopefulness about positive futures. So when we talk about this, we're talking about holistic development, academic achievement, career development, and social-emotional development wrapped in. And I would say time to deliver the really good future planning that's um, based on a lot of optimism. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Do you want to highlight the journal that you just edited that includes much of this data? Um, I, um, a professional school counseling. So we did a, a, a journal where um, study done in the state of Nebraska. We had a, so we had six states, um, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, Nebraska, Utah, uh, Missouri, I hope that's six, and Wisconsin. It was December of 2000. I just remembered my uh, NCAA brackets, Wisconsin. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Okay. But I'm happy to share with you, um, part of the problem is that a lot of the work we do gets wrapped up in journals and, and then it doesn't get out into the field. And it should be criticized too. I'm not, please don't ever take anything that we would say, but, but it, it, we need to get it out into uh, the debate um, because we go through a fairly lengthy review process as, as, we, uh, as we do that. And then the only certain people have access to it. So I would really, uh, somehow we have to get that information out into the field. Um, uh, Could you give us the rest of the activity? December, it was hard December 2013. Yes, December 2, yeah, it just came out. 12, 2, 12, 12, 12 right, yeah. thank you. But I'm saying, yeah, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm putting Lourdes? 2013 on my veto. But <laughs> <laughs> Lourdes, if you take a, t a little time and talk about where and with whom should career guidance or planning outcomes be assigned? Everyone. Everyone in the school has a responsibility for this. School counselors, the professional school counselors, definitely can take a leadership and an advocacy role to ensure that these programs are put in place, to have conversations with teachers, with principals about the value of focusing on career development and career education. But everyone in the school has to have a role. One of the, some of the work that I've been doing in a school is working with teachers in providing lesson plans to students on career development going from 6th to 12th grade. And one of the things that we found is that the activities and the interventions are important, but it's, as has been said before, it's those relationships. You cannot just offer an intervention and then that's it until next semester or next year or the next time that the counselor has an opportunity to provide services. We need to make sure that everyone is talking about and helping students understand the connection between what they're doing every day in their classes and their futures. As the example that um, my colleague gave, you know, teachers are with students a great deal of the time. They have an opportunity to really see what are the issues that are coming up. What are the difficulties that students are having? When a student submits an essay, what are the themes that seem to be emerging? That's an opportunity for the, for the teacher to work with the school counselor to identify critical issues that can be addressed in a much more preventative way rather than waiting until that problem with this young individual, for example, who lost his grandmother, develops into a failing situation. So everyone in the school has to be responsible. Yes, the professional school counselor, I believe, through career development and a comprehensive school counseling program, has to basically set tone, the model. But the school counselor, without the support of the administration, as has been said, is not going to be able to implement those kinds of programs. They're going to be distracted, pulled away for the emergencies, for the, the other tasks that need to be taken care of because of priority issues. There, I, you know, the schools can be a very chaotic, crazy environment where so many things are going on and it's very easy to lose focus on what really we're trying to accomplish in the long term. Working with an administration that understands that we're looking at 
the future and how we have to work towards the future helps put in place the type of programs and basically save and secure and sort of respect those programs <clears throat> so that counselors aren't being pulled away for other tasks. So definitely the administrators. As I said before, the teachers. Not only do the teachers spend so much time with the students and have these very powerful relationships, whether they're negative or positive, they're powerful relationships in terms of helping young people make the connections about why they're there, what they want to accomplish, what are the issues that they're dealing with. And teachers also have something else that they can do. As was mentioned here, they can make sure that they integrate into the curriculum, into what they're teaching, discussions about the world of work discussions about careers, discussions about how is biology related to different types of occupations, how is math related to different types of occupations, what is the process that someone who wants to become a doctor, and that's one of the, the, the top categories that students tend to identify, they want to become a doctor, a lawyer, basically the, the top ten you might say that are on everyone's mind, will have discussions about well, what does it, what does it take to do that? And how do we sort of prepare today, academically, so that in the future you will have those skills? Because it's not just about the aspirations, those are extremely powerful. They're definitely gonna drive the students in terms of helping them take responsibility. But how do they understand that what they're doing today is going to be able to help them in the future? The school staff. In the school that I've been working with over the past seven years, it is amazing in the narrative that the students share with us is that the support staff, the secretaries, are very important in terms of facilitating and helping them in terms of when we organize a career day, when we basically have visitors come to the school, when we have students, one of the things that we had done is have students attend a career day, but prior to the career day, they had the bios of the people that were coming to the school and they had discussions in the classroom about questions that they'd want to ask. And then we organized it as a conference, so students had to identify the top three speakers that they wanted to attend. And working with the staff to sort of help them identify, well, based on their interests, which would be the best speakers. And those discussions with the staff, the support staff, who we might say, well, they're in the office doing more of the, of the administrative work, those relationships really are very powerful for the students. Working with the parents. I cannot mention the countless times that I've heard professionals say, well, some parents don't care. Some parents, they don't come. They don't, they're not interested. And the reality is that, do we really understand what we're saying when we're saying parents don't come, <coughs> parents don't care? In communities of low socioeconomic status, in communities of diversity, we are working with populations that parents are probably working two or three jobs to just put food on the table and a roof over people's heads. How can we connect with parents to really understand what they're dealing with and help them understand that what we're doing in terms of career guidance and education can be a path for them and their children out of the circumstances that they're in so that they can work with their kids at home to whatever capacity to help them appreciate, respect, acknowledge, and value the education that they're getting and help them take responsibility. How do we reach out to parents to help them understand the process? Well, parents don't understand. Well, why should they? They're not educators. They don't work in the school system. Why should they understand how we do business? What can we do to help parents understand how things work? understand how they can be a part of the process, how we can find out from them what are the concerns that they have in the issues and provide them with information about pathways, information about financial aid, information about high schools and colleges that their students can apply to, their kids can apply to. So the parents are a very big component in this. And even when we're talking about parents <coughs> who are working two or three jobs, racially, ethnically diverse parents who may be dealing with a lot of other types of structural barriers, structural complex, complexity to their lives, the challenges they're facing, they all do care. Is their definition of caring, is their definition of what they can do the same as ours as educators? Probably not, but they do care. How can we make connections with them so that we're working together rather than what seems to me is sort of an opposition? It's them and then us in the school system. Community. 
the community, in, the people in your community, whether the work that I've been doing as a, as a counselor educator with the school has been through a partnership with the school and the university. But we've also reached out to a lot of people in the community to come in and share their expertise. What opportunities are available in the community for our children to get exposure and experience about what is out there, what possibilities out there? How can we bring others into the school rather than approaching it as, okay, this is my task, this is what I need to do, and that's it. How do we open up so that we get collaboration and support from others? This is not one person's responsibility. This is not one professional title's responsibility. It is all of our responsibilities. And there are ways that we can work together and support each other. But we're not having those discussions, especially given the high stakes testing and the need for accountability and accountability, less and less time is being spent on establishing those personal connections and more on documenting, well, what did you do and how do, can you prove that it was successful? Yes, accountability has its place. But when accountability and the things that people need to do to demonstrate accountability take away from working with people, from working with kids and understanding them and developing those personal relationships, then we're not helping our kids. We're not helping them. Because, you know, as, as was said before, um, many times throughout this I've heard the importance of having those relationships. And if we're looking at our students as basically numbers on a spreadsheet, who got fours and who got threes, and our focus is on how do we demonstrate that we're doing a good job, and do not put faces and life stories to those numbers, then we are not really helping the children that we're supposed to be helping. And we're not helping the families or the communities and we're not helping ourselves because in the future, these are the children that are gonna be taking care of us and we're not doing a good job. Thank you, Lourdes. Skip, most studies point to career guidance as central to solving the school to college and work transition. What structural barriers or contextual issues need to be addressed to provide the greatest return of what we do? Um, <coughs> Well, one thing that comes to mind related to that is uh, I've had the, the opportunity to participate in um, the, uh, career development and public policy symposia that have been sponsored by OECD and held throughout the world since 1999. And I have to tell you, so we get uh, 30, 40 countries participating in those symposia, and we really focus on what the, uh, what the uh, uh, respective federal policies are related to career development and the kinds of interventions that are happening as a, as a result of those policies that support those interventions. And uh, every time I go there, I kind of duck my head in terms of uh, what's happening at other, in other countries and what's not happening in the United States. So first off, I think at a kind of a macro level, there is no federal support for this, or very little. You know, if we could get the words career guidance in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, what, what a great uh, accomplishment that would be. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's one barrier that uh, I think we all, in a policy sense, uh, need to advocate for very strongly. And again, it's embarrassing when I compare what we do here, what we don't do here, and what's done in, in, in many, many other countries. Um, we've talked about the, uh, the piecemeal uh, application of career development services and how much sense that doesn't make. And so I, I think we do need to be focus in a more of a whole school approach that is comprehensive and systematic uh, across all levels. I had the opportunity just once, I'm sorry to say, but just once I had the opportunity to go into a school system and, 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 and do that. We created, we had the elementary school counselors, the middle school counselors, the high school counselors together, and for a week we developed a comprehensive career guidance program that they were going to implement then across their school system. So the middle school counselors knew what the elementary school counselors were doing related to career development with their students. The high school counselors knew what the middle school uh, counselors were doing related to providing career services to their students. And there was that seamless sort of uh, application of career, uh, career development programming that was, I think, quite um, impressive, but unfortunately quite unique as well. But I want to come back to the hope, uh, the hope uh, theme that a couple of us have mentioned. And we need, we really need to, we stud to study people like you, Bob, because uh, I, the, your story is so impressive. And how you're able to main, 
retain hope despite the many challenges that you encountered uh, in, in, in growing up. Um, and, and as we know, uh, many students are, are not able to do that. And if you look at our literature even related to uh, uh, hope, the role of hope in career development, uh, you'll find very little uh, addressing uh, hope specifically. We kind of assume, I guess, that it'll, it'll, it'll happen, it'll, it'll kind of come along if we, if we just keep working with students in some ways, and, and often that, that does occur, but often it, it doesn't occur as well. So uh, what I would say we need to be focused on more intentionally uh, is the, the need to create a sense of, of hope within, within students. And so um, could I do just a quick uh, uh, exercise with you? So um, if you could just think of, of, of three goals, very quickly, three goals that you would like to uh, accomplish in the next three years. Three goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next three years. If you could just jot something down uh, real quickly. It's only take a couple of minutes. But three goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next three years. Please do your own work on this. <laughs> And then for each goal, just identify a couple of things that you could do between now and then to increase the probability of that goal occurring. Got it? So what are some steps that you could take to increase the probability of that, of your achieving that uh, particular goal? You know, take a course, do some, some kind of specialized training, don't do any training, <laughs> don't take a course. <laughs> Three, some things that you could do, some steps that you could take to increase the probability of achieving that goal. And then finally, if, if you could look at each goal you listed, look at the steps that you identified, and then in a very honest way, uh, give yourself a rating between one and five. One, uh, this is definitely going to happen. I will take these steps uh, to achieve this goal. Five, not going to happen. One, definitely going to happen. Five, it's just not going to happen. Give yourself an honest rating, but make sure your names are on these papers. <laughs> <laughs> so in this group, uh, very high-functioning folks, obviously, uh, you, maybe you all said, you know, here are my goals, and I'm absolutely going to achieve all of these. This is definitely going to happen. I'm going to do, I know what to do, and, I, and I'm motivated to do it. But imagine if your ratings were five for all of your goals. It's just not going to happen. It's not likely to happen. Here's a goal I can identify, but it's not likely to happen. Right? I don't know how to make it happen. Even if I know how to, have, how to make it happen, I'm not likely to, to, to move forward in that direction. I don't have the support to move forward in that direction. So for many of the students that we work with, that's their situation. And if we simply assume that they're all one, they're all writing everything one, that, that they're just going to jump in there and do what they need to do to achieve their goals, we're going to miss out. And that's what we're doing, I think, in many cases. We're going to miss out on opportunities to help those students. And we can do that, I think, simply by teaching them specific sorts of uh, skills that um, uh, are directed towards increasing hope in their lives and uh, its goals, pathways, and agency are the three components of uh, creating hope-based interventions. Thank you, Skip. And I would say Skip's work related to hope is probably leading the field in new conceptual models, so his literature is quite wide as well. Phil, you've spent 35 years in many countries training and supporting counselors. Uh, what have you learned from that in three minutes? <laughs> um, to me, the issue of scale was always uh, an issue, and we talked about, um, you know, we heard about Europe. In 11 cities now, 6,000 people have been touched. This program has touched several hundred, several thousand, whatever. Um, I've always been crazy enough to think that in some small way I could actually change the world, and I was only interested in things that were the best in the world. So um, I'm going to talk to you about scale. Um, 
I, I was fortunate enough to create, uh, to not create, I did not invent it, but coordinate a project called The Real Game, which ultimately went to over 100,000 classrooms in 15 to 20 countries around the world. And when you think about that, that's classrooms spending 20 to 30 to 40 hours on something uh, and multiply that by the number of kids, that's touching quite a few people. And that's about imagining you're not who you think you are. You're a person 15 years in the future trying to create a life for yourself. And they all come back from that. Ex and Barb, the superintendent in Napa, can, can tell you about the fun that we've had in making it happen there. Um, when you get a glimpse of a future that excites you and you believe that it's possible and you've got hope, anything is possible. And it doesn't just change the future, it changes everything right now. So, um, and, and I think, you know, touching 100,000 classrooms was pretty good. I'm fairly proud of that. Um, but I have to tell you that it's way fewer than that now. It's probably fewer than 50,000 classrooms in the world because governments have all changed, funding patterns have all changed. Even though everybody knows that program changed lives, uh, it costs too much time. It took too much time away from academic curriculum. It was guidance, which is not high on the priority list. So um, the program I'm with now, Career Cruising, I think you'll like these numbers. We're in 80% of all of the secondary and post-secondary schools in Canada. We're in 80% of all of the public libraries in Canada. We're in 75% of all the employment centers in Canada. <coughs> That's pretty good scale, I think. Uh, it's 100,000 conversations every day with Canadians about their career dreams and concerns. But the program, as great as it is, is used superficially in 90% of the places where it's used. The math teacher can't answer the career question, points the kid to the guidance counselor, the guidance counselor says, go <coughs> talk to career cruising, that'll sort you out. That's like saying you got a math question, go look at the textbook, come back next year and tell me if you resolved math 10. You know, it just doesn't work that way. We have to put much, much more of a priority. Problem, you're going to tell me. The problem is that um, counseling isn't working. In spite of incredible programs and incredible people and incredible research and incredible ideas, most counselors didn't go there because they gave a damn about careers. It's about psychosocial or academic advising. Um, many of them are, are wrapped up in academic, uh, sorry, administrative duties and don't have the time. Most of them, there's very little prestige for counseling in most schools. You know, the math teachers and the science teachers are the cock of the walks and, and guidance is somewhere way down the list. Um, and um, so, so I think the whole system, I'm agreeing with everybody here and Lourdes, I think the entire education system should be totally fixated on one thing, preparing students for success now and the moment they step out of school. We've got a problem in Canada. We do well on the PISA scores. You know, we're top five, top 10, always. So our education system likes to pat itself on the back. But you know that we've got 50% now of young people coming out of our colleges and universities, and we've got the highest post-secondary rate in the OECD, stepping into either unemployment or underemployment. They've got their degrees, they followed their dreams, they followed their passion, they did what everybody told them. And now they've stepped out into debt and confusion about what to do next. They don't know how to handle financial literacy, they don't know how to handle a whole bunch of things about managing a successful life. So the whole curriculum, I mean, we focus and measure the wrong things. We, we really do, and it's about a system justifying itself. It's not about a system preparing kids for success. And when we could start measuring hope and optimism and confidence and excitement and intentionality and purpose and direction, then we'll have something. But we're not there now. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Phil, very much for the passion you brought to the world, for sure, in that area. Bob, could you talk a little bit about from a state perspective, uh, what can states learn from your South Carolina model? In uh, year 2000, uh, when I assumed the state directorship of career and technical education, actually in 1998, uh, we began to develop a statewide system to evaluate career and technical and to reform it in terms of delivery as well as programmatic reform. And we developed a 2020 vision at that time with 10 principles uh, in that 2020 vision. 
And in fact, when I left the department uh, July of 2011, we were in the process at that time of revisiting uh, that 2020 vision. As that moved forward, part of uh, the effort then, once that reform took place, was to look at legislation that in fact would create uh, the opportunity for districts to be able to implement programs that would support uh, the reforms that were in fact taking place. Um, and so with about 5,000 people providing input both online and regional meetings, in fact Bill Daggett came into our state to lead a lot of those regional meetings. Uh, we, we developed a piece of legislation called Education Economic Development Act, EEDA, June 2005, that set forth a pathway system that connected uh, PK through uh, uh, 20 to be able to provide students uh, several things. One was to develop the, the opportunity for the elementary school level, and we talked about it here with the panel, to, re to create a comprehensive career awareness system that in fact begins to, to build the foundation of career decision making. And in the middle school, assessment would occur, and in that assessment, uh, the highest interest would, would be identified. And from that was the requirement that there would be an individual graduation plan developed that would be electronically driven and in fact, that would be a flexible plan with parent and student and counselor meeting on an annual basis through uh, the year 2000, uh, during the 10th grade where they would make the final decision on a career major. So our system was built around majors, uh, pathway system. Uh, in career and technical side, it's, it's uh, delivered through completers uh, to make sure that there's a four core sequence that connects prepare the students for those majors. And there were basically uh, five important aspects of, of the legislation. Uh, through the pathway system, one was to increase uh, completion rate, which has occurred. Uh, we've had the fastest growing completion rate of any state in the country in regards to high school graduation. Also to make education rigorous and also relevant. Part of that was to create a dynamic shift to where uh, PBL was a focus of uh, the delivery of the education. Uh, also increased support for high-risk students of dropping out, and then to promote a seamless transition between high school and post-secondary that would allow and provide dual credit, and where that system would be eased, and in fact the legislation established a uh, committee of 40 that was actually housed at higher education uh, to create a dynamic shift, a paradigm shift of the seamless transition. And then to eliminate the discussion between career and college and career and technical and, and college prep and AP and the other kinds of, of labels that we place on students to move to a pathway system. In our state today, we've reduced calling for technical or AP or honors to move toward schools of study, all the 16 clusters within that system, uh, where students actually move through a pathway system. It's a career planning system. And whether you're going to be a welder or a cardiologist or a brain surgeon is that you're moving toward a career. Our uh, superintendent calls it a superhighway in which there are many exits. Exit to complete GED, certificates, two-year associate degree, four-year. Some go off the highway and come back on at different points. But it is about choice. And so that students have and feel free that on that highway are all students. Some exiting and some going further but they're all in it together without being labeled. So I think the legislation created a system of career development that focused on the student strengths and a system that supports uh, career decision making to enable students to be able to make choices based upon assessments and based upon career planning. Thank you, Bob. I'd like each of the panelists now to make one sentence that's uh, as provocative as they can be to try to stimulate you in the last uh, five minutes and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. Rich, one minute, please. Uh, 
I was going to. I had to share quickly. I have to share my unrealistic goal, though. That's not going to happen in three years. Is to completely pay off the college tuition debt uh, that we've racked up over the last eight years. I don't know how many of you wrote that down as one of your goals. <laughs> <laughs> my only strategy I can think of is to. Uh, I'm going to officially surrender to Sally May, and maybe they'll take care of me. I don't know. I, I don't know. But here's here's my provocative thing. Um, write down this: 50, 50, 50, and 50. Four fifties. 50% of 12th graders leave high school without the career and college counseling that they and their families need. 50% of schools have not fully implemented the career development components of what we're calling the Ask a National Model. 50% of counselor time is not devoted to delivering high, high quality career and college counseling services. And, and I was looking at, uh, at this on uh, some IES demographic data, 50% of young adults during the first five years after they've graduated from a four-year college are not employed in a career that matches their long-term interests and goals. They're just passing through, okay? Yeah. After spending $200,000 for a four-year degree? Okay, come on now. Uh, so what I would say is it costs everybody. Better career pathways, counseling, and planning would greatly reduce this number. That's a hypothesis we could test. Thank you. Lourdes. I thought about this a long time. Um, went through a variety of different things. And what I would say is examine your expectations of your students. Examine the expectations of your teachers, your staff, your counselors, everyone of your students. What are your expectations of your students based on who they are? Whether it be socioeconomic background, race, ethnicity, behavior, what are your expectations? Because your expectations of those kids is gonna influence what you do, how you do it, and what you see as possible. It's gonna influence what your priorities are. It's gonna influence how you interact. Everyone, every day, needs to examine what are my expectations and how are my expectations influencing my actions. It's not until we realize what are expectations, what are the motivators that are pushing us to do certain things that we then determine, okay, is this the best way to approach the outcome? Is this the best way to help this individual? These are my expectations. How can I work to make sure that those expectations do not keep me from limiting the opportunities that someone has based on my expectations? And that will definitely address what your priorities are in terms of how you work with individuals, your schools, your parents, your teachers, your students every day. Great. Skip. Uh, briefly, uh, policies matter. So let's act accordingly and advocate for infusing career language in public policy. It will make a difference. Secondly, uh, hope matters. So let's be intentional in creating hope in, the, in our students. Okay, thank you. Phil? Wow, you said brief. Surprised you. Okay, provocative was the word. Um, let me just say this. Um, Counselors will never be the experts on the world of work. Teachers will never be the experts on the world of work. Parents aren't the experts. That's blind leading the blind more often than not because most of them didn't find their dream career. The only hope is connecting employers. Uh, we've now, um, when, you, when you scale to, for example, all students in Kentucky having an individual pathways plan from grade six to grade 12 with the completion standards required at every stage, every school, every student. Now when you start throwing, that's a lot of students, now when you start throwing tens of thousands of employers into that mix in a safe way so kids can say, here's my dream, here's my pathway. By the way, we offer free parent portal for every student to, uh, so their parents can help them. Here's my plan. If I do follow that trajectory and come out the pipeline with this certificate degree, who's going to want me and how can I meet them now and find out if I want them down the road? And allow employers to say within a 100 mile radius of here, who's sitting in grade 10 dreaming of being a tool and die maker, being a, you know, a criminal lawyer, whatever it might be, and how can we meet them now and find out if they're what we want and start the conversation? 
because only employ even employ employers are confused about where the world of work is going, but nobody knows more. And we've got to just start the conversations between kids with informed dreams and people with talent gaps and, and, and let them go from there. Thank you. Uh, one closing comment I uh, failed to mention a while ago. Uh, I was able to go back to the local level uh, last year, in 2011, to build a pathway school called the Center for Advanced Technical Studies. We've had almost 5,000 visitors through that center uh, since last August. Uh, a controversial, I guess, statement would be, I think we need to eliminate 75% of this mass testing. Uh, I think it would free up guidance counselors to do their jobs and move toward assessment of end of program of end of course that prepares students and gives them a barometer of their skill sets of what they know and can do tied it into career guidance and development so that the focus becomes on an outcome rather than the education for more education. We, the system has to be changed and it's got to be changed sooner rather than later and we keep adding programs and initiatives and assessments and we keep driving this train that frankly is off the track and we need some kind of change. Wonderful. I hope that was a good uh, efficient use of our time. Let's see if we could direct questions to individuals and please make questions rather than statements. Thank you, sir. So I've heard a lot of you talk about that we don't test uh, and, and assess things like hope and, and becoming identity achieved and, and all of the things that, that you so eloquently are talking about. And yet I would argue from a lot of work we've done out in Sonoma County that that, that does drive um, the types of, of assessment we do. I mean, if, if students are engaged, they're going to be more effective in things. The issue becomes in trying to sell that to people who don't quite make that connection, finding data. Can any of you point to data that supports the, the argument that I'm making but can't always back up with, with good solid data? I'll, I'll give you one quick one. Um, the, um, the state of North Carolina uh, did a study with SAS, the, the business analytics company, multi-million dollar company with education. 475,000 students using Futures for Kids, which is career cruising in that state. Um, and they found and matched those 475 against the whole, all the students between 6th and 12th grade and found that exposure to our program results in increased end of course, end of um, term and end of course exam results, so academic achievement, especially in STEM related subjects like mathematics. And the more, the deeper they get with the program, the more they do with the program, the more time they spend with the program, the better results get. That's a pretty good end. Could I ask, could I add to that too? Um, there's a ton of research out there, and if you're, I'd be happy to ship you a bunch of, of things and um, little self-promotions. I wrote a book in 2004, uh, and it was titled Career Development Across the K Through 16 Years, and summarized that. Social cognitive career theory, for example, there's a lot of research about self-efficacy, and, and there's a, the hope is one of those consequences of those kinds of things. So, and there are ways to measure it too, so I'd be, so be happy to share that. <coughs> I think we all agree with everything that's been said. The issue is, because policy does matter, how do we get No Child Left Behind reauthorized so that the words career development, career awareness, career guidance are all embedded and checked and we are as accountable for that as we are with all these crazy people running around with clipboards saying it's Tuesday, you have to be on page 27 in social studies because testing is coming up and we're in program improvement. What do we do? Who needs to do it? How do we get it done? It's a tough one. <laughs> we do it together, I think. I, I, that, you know, that, that, and, um, and, and that's the value of coming to something like this, that you know, we've, been, we're, we've not been talking to each other, and if we come together, we stand a much better chance of doing that. Because, and, you know, and there's a lot of good reasons uh, uh, to get behind and support this. So we need to articulate those and then fight for those together. Yeah, I would just say I think we need to build coalitions that, uh, uh, of groups that have a vested interest in this, who are, able, who are willing to work together and uh, there have been a couple of meetings in D.C. hosted by the Center for American Progress related to that, and, uh, it, it, but it's slow going. And part of the, part of the problem rests with uh, some of us who represent the groups that 
we represent, represent in terms of uh, counselor educators and people that do research in this area and so forth in that we're not aggressive enough about getting the important <coughs> data out uh, to folks. A lot of our research tends to focus on uh, theory validation rather than important return on investment outcomes. And so I do also think we need to shift our research to address uh, ROI uh, more clearly and then communicate that information more aggressively working together uh, to convince those who create policy. Um, thanks. I just want to add a comment to this. I don't know, for those of you who were in the federal session yesterday, just a practical response on this. Jay Notes, the Deputy Secretary of Labor, talked about the fact, particularly with so many new members of Congress, they don't actually always fully understand how policies are intertwined um, and how, for instance, WIA reauthorization and ESEA authorization might work together or at cross purposes. And one of the most important things that she suggested is getting in front of members um, and really helping to educate about what the key issues are, you know, why Perkins matters, what kind of impacts it's going to have. And I think from a practical perspective, if we've got 50 states represented in this pathways effort, if every state took responsibility for trying to educate their key legislators, particularly those on the help committee or others, we could make some significant progress at the policy level. If mm -hmm. yeah, quickly respond, I, and I think it's our messaging too. Um, you know, how many of you heard the public agenda study a couple of years ago? Can I get a little advice here, Homer Simpson, all of that? Uh, you know, half about half of their sample from 20 to 30 um, said, "Well, the council really never took a time to get to know me." But the other half of the sample said the council took the time to get to know me and cared about my learning. And if you look at the report. Half the, the, that half had all the better outcomes. <laughs> See, it, it to say, well, look, you know, it, it's like when you get this, there are clear connections, and we need to focus on that message and to say that there is data out there that's suggestive of this. Can I make a uh, just a response to to Barb and others? I I think I almost think most of the time we need to lure, lose the term guidance and lose the term career development because eyes glaze over with career development and guidance has got a bum rap that I don't know if we can fix. It's almost like every kid deserves to leave the system with informed dreams, plans, and connections. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and uh, this is going to take national leadership. I'm so glad Harvard has stepped up to the plate. I think Ron and uh, and Bill, you know, fantasize about changing the world too, and um, and also I just want to quickly say, we keep talking about best practices, but I don't think we've got a clue what we're talking about there because all we're talking about is new practices. If it's new enough, we want to look at it. We don't seriously look at those best practices that have staying power that we need to be building on. We don't need ten thousand things; we just need a few good things done well. One more question, I believe. As we were sitting in the sessions, we heard a lot about the connections, the really emerging and vital connections between the business community and acad uh, academic <coughs> instruction, uh, both around core curriculum and, and career and technical education. Can you tell me about the efforts that you're making to utilize business as advocates in getting counseling done because they seem <coughs> It seems as though they would be a very powerful beneficiary of improved career counseling. I can Im speak to improved career developmental sure. counseling. Yeah. I can speak to that. I found it intriguing. There were two times that we really clapped or gave applause during this conference. And one comment was about there's a lot of idiots out there who don't know how to, how to do anything. That was one. The second was when someone said, We provide uh, teachers experiences in the world of work to understand what we do, and we pay them in summer internships. There were two times we clapped yesterday. General Electric, way back in the 70s, provided what was called the Education and Industry Program. And in Colorado State, we've been doing that every year. Every one of our school counselors has to spend two weeks in industry to go around and look at the industry and what's happening with trends and understand labor market economics and so forth. And it radically changes the counselor's perspective. If, and if you would look at the way we're going to change the people who do the work, we've got to get them back in industry and suggest they see what the workplace looks like. I think it's probably the best and most quality-based immersion program I know. So each of us would go back and just talk to your chambers of commerce and say, we want to have a summer program where we put teachers and counselors back in the workplace, talk to us about labor economics, understand the training needs you have. That radically changes the lens of a counselor. 
The same way we spend as much time on getting kids into college through admissions and recruiting kids in college as we spend far less on getting them out of college. So we've got to change where we put our priorities. If we want counselors and teachers and staff members to do it differently, we've got to get them in new environments. So I think that's a low cost, high return opportunity that everyone in here can make happen. Uh, the National Career Development Association is, has a lobbyist. They're an educational specialist and is working with the Automation Federation and General Motors and Google right now as a way to try to get something done. And unfortunately, the topic that's important right now is cyber security. So that's the, that's the angle we have this week to try to get our language into what they're trying to do. So I think it is a question of how can this group of people here with Harvard's brand tied to it try to get this discussion at a state level to go to state legislators and governors, which we now hear governors interested in that language, to move forward and try to get it done at that level. Again, I think we have to play to new members in Congress because they don't really understand how things are connected. Uh, the other issue is how little is getting done in Congress and, and what really is top priority. So what do we do at the state level to make that happen? So I think we all plead with your question. It's a very difficult strategy to make happen. And since every politician is purchased, we have to find resources to purchase politicians that believe in this. I want to first say thank you very much for your attention and please become a champion for career guidance. We, we take a lot of hits. You've heard from an exceptional panel who have dedicated their careers and thank you very much for letting Harvard bring us to this conference.